is a massive topic and a very complex one. So we're going to explore consciousness just a little bit, specifically unitive consciousness. We're going to talk about the joy of our uniqueness and the difficulties and the despair we may encounter over the divisiveness that we see. And finally, we're going to talk about how we can find balance in the midst of all of this. So let's begin with consciousness. Consciousness is the subject of debate among scholars and scientists across the globe. It is a fascinating topic. Research into the realm of consciousness has involved neuroscientists, philosophers, religionists, quantum physicists, and so many others. Much of this research focuses on a materialistic perspective of consciousness, based on the concept that consciousness is produced by our brain. You see that first picture indicating that consciousness starts in our brain and is radiated outward. There's an alternative perspective, however, and this alternative perspective is that consciousness is a fundamental aspect of the universe. This non-material perspective focuses on the brain as a type of receiver of the consciousness that exists in the universe. The second picture is sort of a metaphor for that interconnectedness of all. Ramana Maharshi, a Hindu sage from the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, put it very clearly. Mind is consciousness, which has put on limitations. You are originally unlimited and perfect. Later, you take on limitations and become the mind. The focus of our current exploration is closer to this perspective, this non-materialistic perspective. We may think of it as spiritual or unitive consciousness. As spiritual seekers, we may perceive that spiritual consciousness is the ground of all being. That is, it exists both within us and surrounding us. I am reminded of the poem by Kabir, an Indian poet and mystic of the 15th century who is revered by Sikhs, Muslims, and Hindus alike. The first and also last verse of the poem entitled Deep in the Water, a Thirsty Fish. He tells us, it makes me laugh to think that a fish in the water thirsts for a drink. We are like that thirsty fish. We are searching for water and yet the water surrounds us and fills us. It is a lovely metaphor for the spiritual consciousness inherent in the universe. It is everywhere. It inhabits everything. It surrounds us, supports us, and fills us. All beings, all physical forms, are united within the consciousness of the universe whatever you call it, the divine, the infinite, the all, maybe God, Jehovah, Allah, Parabrahm. It doesn't matter what we call it. It is the ground of being. Now, instead of saying that we're all united within this ground of being, it is more accurate to say that the consciousness of the universe is embodied in all things, in all physical forms. So let's spend just a few minutes 
looking at the concept of unitive consciousness from various perspectives. Max Planck, founder known as the father of quantum physics, tells us, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard it matter as a derivative of consciousness. Deepak Chopra, in his book, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, writes, your entire reality springs from an invisible spiritual world of consciousness, pulsing with energy that connects everything in the universe. And from Eckhart Tolle, we read, at the deepest level of being, you are one with all that is. Swami Vivekananda tells us, the great lesson is that unity is behind all. Call it God, love, spirit, Allah, Jehovah. It is the same unity that animates all life from the lowest animal to the noblest man. Judith Blackstone, in her article, Inhabiting the Body as Unitive Consciousness, looks at various sources that address unitive consciousness. She includes authors Ken Wilbur and A.H. Almas. She also talks about traditions from Asia that address unitive consciousness, including some lineages of Zen, Tibetan Buddhism, the Hindu tradition of Advaita Vedanta, and Kashmir Shaivism. She quotes Long Chen Rabjong, who says, this vast expanse, unwavering, indescribable, and equal to space, is timelessly and innately present in all beings. Blackstone also tells us that unitive consciousness has been called Buddha nature, pure consciousness, self, rigpa, and the clear light of wisdom, mind, among many other names. So the theosophical tradition also asserts that consciousness is unitive. Richard Smoley, editor of Quest magazine and author of numerous books on esotericism, writes, one of the most basic and yet most elusive teachings of theosophy is that consciousness is everywhere. Consciousness, he says, is now revealed as being present anywhere and everywhere in the universe. Our own consciousness is simply one particular and not necessarily privileged form of it. In Theosophy.wiki, the online Theosophical Encyclopedia, we read, Theosophical literature presents consciousness as fundamental, not an emergent property of the cosmos, which is present in everything, including inorganic matter. This same article differentiates between consciousness and self-consciousness when it says self-consciousness or self-awareness is the capacity for introspection and the ability to recognize oneself as an individual separate from the environment and other individuals. It is not to be confused with consciousness. Self-consciousness is the recognition of that awareness. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky co-founder of the Theosophical Society, makes numerous statements about consciousness being unitive, calling it absolute consciousness in order to differentiate it from other forms of the word. 
statements found in her seminal work, The Secret Doctrine, Volume 1, include, Esoteric philosophy teaches that everything lives and is conscious, but not that all life and consciousness are similar to those of human or even animal beings. She continues by saying, Consciousness implies limitations and qualifications, something to be conscious of and someone to be conscious of it. But absolute consciousness, she says, contains the cognizer, the thing cognized, and the cognition. Dora Koontz former president of the Theosophical Society in America, also addresses these concepts when she says, For many reasons, I prefer to think of the different states of consciousness as dimensions or fields. Both these words suggest the possibility of movement within an open, dynamic space. And also, of an infinite expansion into higher reaches of consciousness. Both imply the existence of a greater whole of which the various dimensions or fields are aspects and within which they constantly interact. In speaking about the human energy fields, I always try to emphasize that Everything, including ourselves, exists in terms of this greater whole, which is the universe itself. All the dimensions of consciousness, she says, are present everywhere, in everything, even if only in a rudimentary state. Therefore, we can clearly see that the concept of unitive or spiritual consciousness is not only a key concept within the theosophical tradition, but is found in various spiritual and religious traditions from around the globe and throughout time. So basing our discussion on what many would call the truth, I put that in quotation marks because I'm not sure any of us really know what the truth is. But basing it on the fact that we would somewhat consider this the truth of unitive consciousness. Let's look just a little bit at the joy we may experience because of our uniqueness. Unitive consciousness may be the ground of our being. Yet, we perceive the world in separative ways. Our physical brains classify and categorize everything with which we come into contact. All that we see, feel, smell, taste, and hear. We name things, thus separating them. A chair, a child, a tree, a man, a woman, a flower, and on and on. Well, you're probably familiar with this metaphor, but I'm going to share it again. It is a metaphor that explains the dichotomy of being both unified in consciousness and separate in the physical world. Imagine unitive consciousness as a white light shining through a prism. As that unified white light moves through the prism, it is separated into the distinctive and separate colors of the rainbow. The separate colors of the rainbow provide a beautiful metaphor for the differences we see in the manifested world. It helps us understand the overt and separate characteristics we see, while at the same time recognizing that all of these differences emanate from the same white 
light from the ground of being, unitive consciousness. In physical manifestation, there are no two individuals who are completely alike, not even identical twins. Each is unique. Thank goodness. Have you ever driven down a street and noticed that every house looked exactly like every other house on the street? Can be a little depressing, I think. Can you imagine if gardens had only one type of flower? We might consider it boring after a while. Even gardens are more beautiful when there is variety and uniqueness. Jimmy Carter, former president of the United States, talks about this when he describes the country saying, we become not a melting pot, but a beautiful mosaic. Different people, different beliefs, different yearnings, different hopes, different dreams, he says. What a lovely image he creates with his words. How true his words are. Maya Angelou echoes these words, saying, in diversity, there is beauty and there is strength. Different people, perspectives, ideas, and thoughts strengthen us as individuals and as a society. Stephen Covey, author of The Seven Habits of Effective People, writes, strength lies in differences, not in similarities. When we think of diversity or the differences we see in our world, we don't typically think of strength, do we? Yet it, it truly is. The differences allow each of us to choose our own path career path, life path, spiritual path, to grow in our own way. Through different perspectives, ideas, and thoughts, each of us can choose or even create our own path as we search for truth. We may be reminded of Krishnamurti's statement that truth is a pathless land. As many of us can attest, it takes strength and courage to walk this road less traveled, to borrow from M. Scott Peck. Finding the strength to walk our own path, perceiving the beauty evident in differences, recognizing the inherent unity of all life, allows us to experience a sense of kinship and unity with all beings, with all forms. An appreciation and valuing of the uniqueness found in the manifested world brings many of us tremendous joy and happiness. However, for some individuals, these differences can be perceived as threatening. The focus is then on the separateness or division between people, beliefs, cultures, and on and on. Divisiveness can be defined as something that causes disagreement or hostility. As we look around at what is happening in our world today, divisiveness seems to exist in almost every aspect of physical manifestation with human beings. Political divisions, religious, ethical, moral, and continuing on and on. 
It has pulled apart families, friends, colleagues. Feeling threatened by the perceived differences may be may bring about a range of behaviors. Behaviors that range from the unkind and rude to vicious and inhumane. As we see what is happening in our world, we may feel a sense of despair, a loss of hope. It's likely that many of us have anxiety about the future, wondering if human beings will ever learn to treat each other with kindness, compassion, and love, to come together as one unified whole. In many instances, divisiveness seems to bring about a form of groupthink, where specific groups honor their own beliefs and no others. Specifically, they do not honor or respect the beliefs and perspectives of, again, the others, in quotation marks, regardless of who the other might be. From these intense feelings, can arise behaviors that are appalling and atrocious, behaviors that can be termed inhumanity to humanity. And we don't have to look far for examples of these behaviors. From making denigrating comments about a particular group or posting offensive pictures or statements on social media at one end of the spectrum, to intolerance over gender differences, human rights, social justice, immigration, and more. And to the other end of the spectrum with war, victimization, people being brutally beaten and murdered, others starved to death, or left to die in inhumane conditions. And it continues, doesn't it? I, I really dislike bringing these topics into our awareness, but it is essential that we are aware of the inhumanity that can become manifest when divisiveness exists. It is part of the world in which we live and which can bring many of us to the point of despair. In order to be a part of the resolution, the solution, I should say, in resolving the divisiveness, in order to become a part of that solution, we need to understand it. So Ken Wilber, well-known writer, speaker, and transpersonal psychologist, discusses the divisiveness in very clear language, writing, the simple fact is that we live in a world of conflict and opposites because we live in a world of boundaries. Since every boundary is also a battle line, Here is the human predicament. The firmer one's boundaries, the more entrenched are one's battles. The more I hold on to pleasure, the more I necessarily feel pain. The more I pursue goodness, the more I am obsessed with evil. The more I seek success, the more I must dread failure. The harder I cling to life, the more terrifying death becomes. The more I value anything, the more obsessed I become with its loss. 
Most of our problems, in other words, are problems of boundaries and the opposites they create. Notice the number of times the word I is used in Ken Wilber's statement. The I is the focus in a world of conflict and opposites. When we perceive the world in this way, as a series of I versus you, us versus them, then we live in a world filled with fear. Psychologically speaking, when we feel vulnerable or fearful, as human beings, we tend to use anger to protect ourselves. We almost automatically put ourselves into a defensive position so that we can keep what is ours. In this place, we have no concept of unity. Rather, we see the other as potentially dangerous. And we act from this place of separation and divisiveness. And it seems that almost everywhere we look, we can find pockets, small or large, of individuals who hate or fear another because they are different, because they may take what is ours. So where does this leave us? In the last few minutes, we've talked about unitive consciousness, the joy, of the uniqueness we experience in the physical world and the despair that we may experience when we see the divisiveness and the inhumane behaviors that divisiveness can create. As human beings, we may struggle to find balance. We may wish to resolve the divisiveness that exists. So where do we begin? The teachings found in the ageless wisdom can provide us with guidance. We want the world to be a place of peace, acceptance, and compassion. We want to live in a world where there is no judgment based upon skin color, religious or spiritual traditions, belief systems, ways of self-identifying, and on and on. We want to live in a world of social justice and equity. In other words, we want to radically transform the world, don't we? Transformation, change, such difficult topics. One thing I've learned, and probably you have as well, is that we can't change other people. We try. We, we try to change our children, try to change our partners. But we quickly find that we cannot change another person. So what then can we change or transform? Ourselves. Not that that is a surprise to you. It does seem a bit paradoxical, though, that in order to transform the world, we must change ourselves. However, the ageless wisdom provides the foundation for this statement. If consciousness is unitive, if each of us is grounded in this absolute consciousness, then when one of us changes, it changes the whole. Hard to see that change. But think about a glass of water. If a drop of blue dye is put into the water, we see it swirl for a few seconds, and then it dissipates, leaving the water clear. But we know that that drop of blue dye went in. However, the water slowly 
begins to change color as more drops of blue dye are added. If we think of the water as absolute consciousness and the drops of blue dye, the transformation of individuals, then we realize that one day, whether we see that day or not, one day, the entire glass of water, the consciousness of all, will be transformed. Former international president of the Theosophical Society says, the subject of human transformation is very important because a truly momentous change in the history of humanity will occur only when there is a revolutionary change in the human being. Probably, she says, a sufficient number of human beings must change to bring about a radical change in the course of human history. So what does she mean when she talks about a revolutionary or radical change in each of us? Well, maybe this quote from Krishnamurti will help. He says, to transform the world, we must begin with ourselves. And what is important in beginning with ourselves is the intention. The intention must be to understand ourselves and not to leave it to others to transform themselves or to bring about a modified change through revolution, either of the left or the right. It is important to understand that this is our responsibility, yours and mine. I think that last statement bears repeating. Krishnamurti says, it is important to understand that it is our responsibility, yours and mine, to transform ourselves to transform the world. Our responsibility then, according to Krishnamurti, is our intention to understand ourselves and then make the necessary changes. We do this through objective self-observation. What are we thinking, feeling, saying, doing? What is the intention? behind our feelings, our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Are we congruent? That is, do our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions match our belief system? Match our change? Match our desire for change in ourselves and in the world? It sounds simple, doesn't it, to be congruent? Um, But I think this is one of the very difficult undertakings we have in physical manifestation. It is the work of our soul in physical manifestation. Self-transformation is a process, a process that requires honesty and courage. So how do we begin this process? I think, on a very practical level. Once again, in in psychological circles, there are discussions about which comes first, thoughts, feelings, or behaviors. Well, I'm not going to get into that debate, but one thing is certain. Our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors are connected almost instantaneously. We will focus, for brevity's sake, on thoughts, recognizing that all of these components are interrelated and interdependent upon one another. Our thoughts interact with and impact our behaviors, our language, our feelings. So some examples for you. Many years ago when I was teaching high school, 
a young African-American student said to me that one of the other teachers didn't like black people. Well, I was really surprised at her statement. So I asked her why she felt this way, why she believed this. She said, when he hands out papers in class, he puts them into the hands of the white students. But he doesn't touch the black students when he hands out papers. He just puts their papers down on their desk so he doesn't have to touch them. I was astonished. I have no doubt that she was accurate in her observation, just as I have no doubt that that teacher was unconscious of both his behaviors and the thoughts behind those behaviors. How do thoughts impact our language? Think for a few minutes about the number of times we use the words you or them. Every time we wor use words like I, me, mine, us, them, theirs, you, there is a separation and a division. As we discussed a few minutes ago, one of the basic ideas of theosophy is the fundamental unity of all existence so that all pairs of opposites, matter and spirit, human and divine, I and thou are transitory and relative distinctions of an underlying absolute oneness unit of consciousness. Thus, self-transformation may start with an awareness of the use of separative words and ultimately replacing them with unitive words, such as we, us, and ours, whenever possible. Thus, focusing on unity rather than separateness. Thoughts also impact our feelings. As the comments by Ken Wilbur indicated, when we are attached to something, we cling to it and become concerned about the loss of it. This includes attachment to people, things, beliefs, and so on. When we consider the possibility of losing any of this, we may feel vulnerable. Take my house, take my things. But don't mess with my beliefs. When we consider the possibility of losing any of this, we may feel vulnerable. And as we mentioned, as human beings, when we feel vulnerable or fearful, we use anger to protect ourselves and the things that we value. We begin to perceive others as dangerous, as threatening, and we may even begin to catastrophize about what could happen. For example, if we allow, and you can fill in the blank, someone to change my thinking, if I allow someone to change my thinking, then I may lose my whole worldview. So I'm going to hang on to it because where would I be without my worldview? If we allow blank, fill it in with whatever we value, then everything we value will be destroyed. Our families, our homes, our country, our religion, and on and on and on and on. We see that happening, don't we? So these are very simple examples, yet similar situations occur almost daily for most of us. Our thoughts can be so deeply rooted 
that we have difficulty identifying them. And sometimes even more difficulty owning them. That is, assuming that we actually have the ability to separate ourselves enough to identify what's going on. If we look at these examples, we find, once again, that all of them focus on selfishness. My beliefs, my thoughts, my feelings, my things, my family. We can investigate self-transformation from a deeper perspective than just a psychological one. We can explore it from a spiritual or metaphysical perspective, focusing again on thoughts. From this perspective, thoughts and the accompanying feelings that we experience, or perhaps we should say create, surround us. We don't see them, but they exist. We know from science that everything is energy. Therefore, our thoughts and feelings are energy, perhaps more accurately described as energetic vibrations. And these vibrations emanate from us into the surrounding environment. They impact us, they impact those around us, and ultimately the entire field of awareness. The Mahatma K.H. wrote to A.P. Sennett in the late 19th century, quote, thoughts are things, have tenacity, coherence, and life. They are real entities. We find further elucidation of this concept in another of the Mahatma letters, where it is written, every thought of an individual upon being evolved, passes into the inner world and becomes an active entity by associating itself, coalescing, you might term it, with an elemental. That is to say, with one of the semi-intelligent forces of the kingdoms. It survives as an active intelligent, a creature of the mind's begetting for a longer or shorter period proportionate with the original intensity of the cerebral action which generated it. Thus, a good thought is perpetuated as an active beneficent power, an evil thought as a maleficent power. And so an individual is continually peopling his current in space with a world of his own, crowded with the offsprings of his fancies, desires, impulses, and passions. In other words, we are peopling our world with our thoughts and feelings. Strong thoughts and feelings repeated with intensity and intentionality can actually create forms in the unseen worlds. These forms are frequently referred to as thought forms, a term you've likely heard. Therefore, whether our thoughts and feelings are beneficent or maleficent, we can potentially give them form. Once again, impacting ourselves, those who are around us, and ultimately the consciousness of humanity. Well, it seems safe to assume that we all want to create thought forms that embody love, compassion, understanding, and kindness. However, it's also probably safe to assume that at times we send out thoughts that are not very helpful. If we're cut off in traffic, if someone breaks in line ahead of us, or as it was for me yesterday, I was late to an appointment and every car ahead of me was going so slowly. Thoughts 
and the feelings associated with them can happen so quickly that we are often not aware of them. However, if we want to radically change ourselves, and hence the world, then we must become aware of what is occurring. So how then do we identify those thoughts about which we may not be aware? Are the thoughts that flit through our minds so quickly that we're not really even aware of them? Well, constant self-observation and awareness working very hard to be aware of what we're thinking and feeling instead of just allowing it to happen. It's important that we do this as much as possible every minute of every day. It is hard work, this continuous self-observation. We can also become aware of others' reactions to us about what others say to us or perhaps don't say. We can have open and honest communication with people that we trust, asking for their feedback. And ultimately, listening to our intuition, to that still, silent voice within identification of our thoughts and hence our feelings, our actions, is the first step in transforming ourselves. We cannot change until we know what needs to be changed. Krishnamurti tells us that analysis does not transform consciousness, meaning We're not going to change just by thinking about things, by looking at things. We have to do the work. So we work to make the changes. We transform ourselves by first identifying what needs to be changed and then working to make those changes, changes to our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, changing those aspects that are not congruent with our belief system into something that is congruent with our belief system. Difficult work. And as we all know, change does not happen overnight. That's why our self-transformation is a process. We have to practice. And we will fail at times. And we will need to pick ourselves up and start over. But eventually, the new way of thinking, acting, talking, doing, feeling, will become a part of who we are. So how long do we have to do this? Because this sounds like a lot of work, and it is. Well, apparently we have to do it forever. Krishnamurti tells us that The more you know yourself, the more clarity there is. Self-knowledge has no end. You don't come to an achievement. You don't come to a conclusion. It is an endless river. This, of course, is why we are kind to ourselves. When we fail and we pick ourselves up and start again, It is an endless river. Transformation, as we said, is a process that will take us, as Radha Bernier says, from selfishness to unity. This change to realization is revolutionary, fundamental. Fundamental change is many things. It is change from selfishness to altruism, from strife inside and outside to peace, from ugliness 
And she says, there is a lot of ugliness inside us to beauty and harmony. It is a change from a state of ignorance to wisdom. Therefore, if we want to change the world, and I believe we all do, then we must begin by changing ourselves. Now, as I hear myself talk about these things, I wonder how I would react if I were experiencing some of the horrific things that are happening in our world. If family members were murdered, raped, bombed, abducted, starved, repudiated, and on and on. Please know that I am not excusing or accepting behaviors that defy description. Humanity's inhumanity must never be accepted or excused. Also, please know that I am not suggesting that we shouldn't experience the feelings associated with these situations. We have emotions for a reason. They are part of our physical manifestation and paradoxically help us on our spiritual journey. Feelings must be felt. Anger, heartache, joy, happiness, despair. But it is not helpful to hold on to those that are frequently perceived as negative for long periods of time. As beings in manifestation, we are called upon to work through our feelings, to understand them, to manage them appropriately, and to move forward. Perhaps one of the most difficult tasks we face in the world of manifestation. It is also a very complex topic that maybe we can address at a different time. Each of us will work through our feelings differently. We've touched on a little bit of that work here, but there is so much more. Working on our thoughts and feelings is a part of our spiritual path. Therefore, work through them we must. As we said, this is a part of moving forward on our spiritual path toward conscious unity with all beings and forms. And here we are, back to the concept of unitive consciousness. If we believe that everything is rooted in what may be called the absolute or the infinite or universe, I've added a few names, but there are so many names which unitive consciousness is called by. If we believe that everything is rooted here, then we realize that everything and every one connects at this source. The seeds of the experiences we gain are connected. They become a part of unitive consciousness. This means, if we really think about it, that what I experience and hopefully learn from will become a part of the consciousness of all beings in some way. Just a quick aside to consider, it also means that being angry with or kind to another is the same thing as being angry with or kind to myself and all other beings. The reverse is also true. Being angry with 
or kind to ourselves is the same as being angry with or kind to all of life. Something to consider. As we learn through each of our experiences to be compassionate and loving toward others, then the consciousness of all beings are impacted, even if we're not aware of it. This, again, makes us think of the glass of clear water and the blue dye, or the hundredth monkey effect, and is reminiscent of Rada Bernier's statement that we addressed a few minutes ago. The subject of human transformation is very important because a truly momentous change in the history of humanity will occur only when there is a revolutionary change in the human being. Probably, she says, a sufficient number of human beings must change to bring about a radical change in the course of human history. Of course, many of us are familiar with the hundredth monkey effect, and we read this on the hundredth monkey website. Hundredth monkey is a beautiful metaphor for a phenomena that is being increasingly proven scientifically. It is like the tipping point when just one more person having an awareness could close the loop or complete the blueprint for this knowledge. After that, everyone can tab into the collective consciousness to download the data. It may not be the hundredth monkey or person that it takes to shift the balance into a new reality and paradigm. The website says it may be 300 million or 3 billion. The point is, they say, that we need more people at the leading edge of thought and the frontier of change, especially at this time. Now, the website does use the term collective consciousness, but we can easily insert the term unitive consciousness into the statement. As we each seek to incorporate compassion and love, we are moving towards that tipping point as these thoughts and feelings become a part of the unitive or spiritual consciousness of all beings. Well, we've talked about so much. Let's pull it together and summarize for just a minute or two. Consciousness is unitive, although it appears in the manifested world as diverse. Again, the metaphor of the white light through the prism that manifests in the colors of the rainbow. At our root, we are all connected and we are all one. This diversity, seen by many as a source of joy, providing happiness, beauty, and strength, just to mention a few characteristics. It is also seen by many as a source of fear because of perceived differences. This fear can evoke anger and animosity toward whatever or whoever is perceived as the other. It can also snowball into behaviors that range from rude and unkind to absolutely atrocious and inhumane. These behaviors can cause us to feel despair, a lack of hope for the future of our world. We want to radically transform this world but this requires that we radically transform ourselves. Becoming aware of the impact of our thoughts and then working to bring them into congruency with our belief system is one way to transform ourselves. Being aware of how our 
thoughts impact our behaviors, our language, our feelings, will require us to be consistently self-observant. From this level of observation, we can determine what needs to be changed. And then we can work to make the changes. Ram Das shares this perspective. Remember, we are all affecting the world every moment, whether we mean to or not. Our actions and states of mind matter because we are so deeply interconnected with one another. Working on our own consciousness is the most important thing that we are doing at any moment. And being love is the supreme creative act. How lovely. And Albert Einstein tells us, a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Once again, so lovely. Einstein, of course, writing a hundred years ago, used the word he as the typical way of writing in that time, meaning male and female. So this is how we find balance in a world filled with both joy and despair. Through this process of self-transformation, we are drawing closer to an awareness of the unity of all beings, of all forms in the manifested world. As we begin to grasp tiny insights into the reality of unitive consciousness, we are flooded with love for all. This is the love of agape. Agape love, redundant, but agape from the Greek, is the love that exudes understanding and empathy for all. It is the highest form of love that moves us beyond self-centeredness into altruism. Richard Rohr founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation, equates unitive consciousness with love. And not just any type of love, but the deepest love that allows one to move away from a separative perspective into a unitive one. He tells us that, quote, self-consciousness in the negative sense slowly falls away and is replaced by what the mystics call pure consciousness or unitive consciousness, which is love. May we all move toward love. Thank you so much for your time.